Welcome to Jack Chat, presented by the Journal of Athletic Training, the official journal of the National Athletic Trainers Association. I'm Dr. Kara Radzak from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the purpose of today's event is to provide a little bit more information for athletic trainers and other healthcare professionals on the recently published manuscript entitled Gender Differences in Psychological Responses to Recovery After Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction Before Return to Sport. Today, I am joined by the manuscript's lead author, Dr. Caroline Lise, who performed this investigation during her time at Michigan State University. Caroline, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So first of all, congratulations on receiving your new doctoral degree, and please give us an update on what you're currently doing. Sure. Um, So I am currently a postdoctoral research associate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, in the motion lab. And um, I am looking into how mechanical loading is associated with the development of post-traumatic osteoarthritis after anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction uh, and some different aspects that contribute to uh, aberrant uh, changes in mechanical loading, such as potentially psychological barriers. Great. So we look forward to seeing that research in Journal of Athletic Training in, in the future. But today we're going to be talking about a little bit about what you did while you you are still at Michigan State. So can you give us um, a little bit more background into the study? It's no secret that ACL injury rates are different between the sexes, but in general, what's known about differences in rehabilitation and recovery? Yeah, so uh, I think you brought up a great point, which is we do understand that a lot of times in non-contact injuries are higher in female athletes, uh, but uh, 24 to 30% of young female athletes who ended up returning to sport actually experienced a second ACL injury within two years after reconstruction, and females were also less likely to return to their pre-injury level of sport compared to their male counterparts. And so when diving into the literature of understanding why we were seeing some of these differences, um, we started to see that some adult females reported greater psychological distress and also some lesser self-efficacy during their recovery uh, process uh, processes. And, um, and since psychological barriers, while we've known for a long time, influence a person's recovery process, they've been more and more accepted and integrated into uh, current return to play outcomes that we look at when deciding whether an individual is ready to return to play along with some of the physical outcomes that we consistently look at. Um, And so we um, really wanted to understand some of these psychological barriers a little bit different, differently between males and females. So give us some more information about kind of the the path that led you down to this focus on adolescent athletes and this research question you developed? Yeah. So like I said, uh, we were interested in these uh, gender differences uh, that we've seen previously reported in adults. We were fortunate enough in our lab to consistently work with adolescent populations. So a majority of our patients that we saw at Michigan State tended to be between the ages of like 14 and 18, so that high school age. And they have um, very different lived experiences from, you know, collegiate athletes or young adults. And so what we saw in the literature is that it a lot of the um, uh, psychological research was reported in these young adult populations. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to see... Um, if there were any differences or explore it more in a younger adolescent population. So let's go a little bit into the methodology. You had a unique design in that you looked at both the quantitative with patient reported outcome measures and then the qualitative aspect. So tell us more about what did the qualitative design bring to the table in your understanding? Yeah. um, So Uh, I was very fortunate enough for this qualitative uh, paper to work with some fantastic qualitative researchers, um, Dr. Erickson and, and Erickson and Dr. DeSanti, who uh, we did a previous qualitative study with that kind of informed this project, actually. Um, and uh, 
the qualitative design provides this um, more exploratory experience of um, some of these more abstract concepts of psychological barriers um, that um, are a little bit more difficult to understand potentially in the confines of like a specific statistical analysis when we're when we're looking at outcomes of recovery. And so um, the qualitative design allowed us to dive a little bit deeper uh, beyond some of the uh, patient reported outcomes that we typically use. And I don't want to downplay the patient reported outcomes because I'll probably talk about it later, but um, things like using the ACLRSI or the TSK-11, which are measures of psychological readiness and kinesiophobia, are essential to a clinician's toolkit to utilize. But as you saw from, or if you read the article, what you'll see is that the patient reported outcomes quantitatively um, did not differ between participants. This was a small sample size, so I will acknowledge that as a limitation. Um, but when we did the exploratory uh, qualitative analysis, while we didn't find differences on the patient report outcomes, we did still uh, see differences in their lived experiences that they described when we talked to them face-to-face -face through interviews. So you're seeing this mismatch between patient reported outcome measures and your qualitative themes and findings. Let's dive a little bit more into the qualitative. Um, what were maybe for somebody who doesn't have a qualitative background, how did this go about um, as far as methodology and ending up with the themes that you did? Yeah, I will try and be brief about it because... Um, it's a long process. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and I um, had before this only done quantitative-based assessments and, and research and um, have really grown... Um, um, a greater respect for individuals that do the qualitative research because it's a, it's a long and difficult process, but very rewarding. Um, and so we uh, first, you know, designed this uh, survey that we pilot tested um, in an in individual uh, to, to get some feedback on how that survey was going. And from the survey, we really just wanted to understand a person's re uh, recovery through a psychological lens. Um, and what we ended up doing from there was uh, going through each of um, the interviews and um, trying to uh, fit the individual's responsive r responses uh, deductively into five different categories that we uh, found uh, consistently reported throughout the literature. So examples of those would be like self-efficacy, psychological distress, locus of control, athletic identity, and um, fear of re-injury or fear of movement. And then um, we found that all of those um, uh, themes were emphasized within these participants, but then we inductively, meaning we put our own uh, um, perceptions of their responses um, to um, understand the differences between males and females within those specific themes. Um, and uh, so basically that's how uh, we maneuvered through the methodology. You have to go through each interview um, individually and you come together. We had four people actually going through and looking for individuals' responses um, and um, trying to interpret what they were telling us. So let's talk a little bit more about the primary sub themes that you found. So you mentioned them before, those um, those five, psychological distress, self-efficacy, athletic identity, locus of control, and fear of re-injury. And I think uh, some of those like fear of re-injury are pretty intuitive, but let's get into um, locus of control. What is locus of control and how did your findings relate to this concept? Sure. Um, so locus of control refers to a person's belief in the relationship between their outcome, their actions and an outcome. So in this case, the actions may be the person's um, own actions. So what they're doing on a day to day basis, or it might also be the actions of others that influence them. So in this case, a lot of times the external act 
actions may have been from healthcare teams, so athletic trainers, physical therapists, um, uh, and surgeons as well. Um, and then the outcome is like the success of their or the progress of their recovery after the ACL reconstruction. And so in the case of um, there's a there's a few different types of lo locus of control. Uh, internal locus of control is commonly reported, and that's uh, a person's belief that their personal uh, actions will directly impact an outcome. So they feel like they have greater control over the situation versus an external locus control refers refers to other people's actions or influence that will directly impact the outcome. Um, so like I said, in this case, some of those beliefs with a higher in ex, excuse me, external locus of control were shaped by the healthcare providers and, and their parents actually as well. Um, and so in this study, both males and female uh, adolescent athletes described experiencing a high internal locus of control, but females also talked about this compromising balance with some of the external locus of control as well. So they basically reported that um, feeling that some of their progress or how they perceive their um, success could uh, potentially also be influenced by some of um, the social aspects or social interactions that they had with healthcare providers, teammates, and um, parents as well. So how does this finding of the female athletes having a little bit more interaction with the external locus of control, how can we as clinicians utilize that? What What's kind of the take-home clinical message based upon this finding? Um, yeah, so, well, I think that it's important first to um, understand that um, uh, the there can be different types of uh, things that are influencing how a person perceives their control over the outcome, and that can come from internally or externally. Um, and so, especially with things like internal locus of control. If you're trying to balance these aspects, um, uh, certain tools in your kit, such as like self uh, positive or positive self talk, excuse mm -hmm. me, um, can really help with um, internal, improve internal locus of control and also self efficacy. Um, so find uh, in individuals that may be deferring to some of these more external locus of control where they don't really have a ton of control over what a person is telling them or their interactions may try and find ways to um, improve their internal locus of control through something such as positive self-talk. Great. What are some other differences that were um, seen with males and females? Um, so I think uh, uh in terms of, there were a few things that were kind of like both shared, but then kind of when you dove deeper were a little bit separate. So um, many of the participants experienced this loss of um, identity, um, but they also described that this experience um, was an opportunity for personal growth. Mm -hmm. So uh, with uh, Participants basically described that this whole ACL injury and the very long recovery process was a, a moment of adversity in their lives that they may or may not have experienced previously. But ultimately, the recovery process was an opportunity to build their skills in coping and ultimately overcome adversity. Um, fear of movement was also consistently reported between participants, but this is where one of the differences uh, appeared a little bit in more depth. So uh, males often reported with this fear of movement that uh, very specific with very specific sports tasks. So they uh, really highlighted, they tended to highlight jump, jumping, landing, cutting as, as tasks that they're very specifically fearful of um, integrating back into. Females described it more as a general return to activity. And this wasn't necessarily just related to sports, Sports were often reported, um, but it was also things just like general physical activity, like strength and conditioning activities, and also running. Mm -hmm. um, many of the participants also reported mood changes, especially within the initial months of recovery through things such as frustration and sadness. Um, but uh, uh, the female adolescent athletes tended to have 
uh, be very aware of the fluctuations within their mood throughout the, the recovery process. So let's go back to that fear of movement. And you do a very good job throughout this manuscript, especially in the discussion of really bringing in some actionable items that clinicians can take away from your manuscript. And one of the things that you talked about was this um, graded exposure, this concept of graded exposure. Can you go into a little bit more explanation of what graded exposure is and how you recommend differences in graded exposure between males and females? Sure. Um, so I am no expert on graded exposure, um, although I hope to do a study in the future incorporating it because I think that it's um, a really awesome uh, intervention or, or tool to have in a clinician's kit. Um, and people may actually uh, utilize this more in their practice um, more than they acknowledge. But uh, one of the things is uh, you're basically the idea behind graded exposure is uh introducing a task, but then increasing the complexity of the task over time so that uh, individuals feel very safe in the beginning um, in a controlled environment. And then they can, uh, uh, so they can sort of face whatever fearful activity they're feeling, but feel a little bit safer about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, obviously increasing the complexity. What um, might be different um, or a way to change how you actually do this in your practice is to utilize something as simple as like a visual analog scale, which is just asking a person how confident they're feeling or how fearful they're feeling on a scale of zero to 10. Um, and uh, based on that response, you can first identify which activities individuals are feel, feeling the least confident or the most fearful with. And then as you start to introduce them into the task and um, increase the complexity, you can ask them afterwards how they're feeling utilizing this, you know, um, scale from zero to 10. Um, uh, to see if there's been improvements and if you should therefore move forward with increasing the complexity of the task over time. So it, it provides a little bit more of, of a numbers approach. Mm -hmm. um, and But it's a really simple question that can really be asked to determine, um, get more involved with psychologically how they're feeling and not necessarily about um, the numbers of the physical side of, of their progress. So based upon your findings and differences between males and females, when would you initiate this with a female athlete as opposed to a male? Yeah, uh, great question. You did ask that earlier. Um, so with uh, males, I would say that maybe, uh, I mean, for anyone, it should be initiated with whatever task they're feeling uncomfortable or fearful with. But based on our results, we found that uh, that males tended to report um, this fear of movement with those jumping and uh, running tasks. So like when you're in the clinic and you're starting to introduce things like hopping or cutting or jumping, that might be the case where you incorporate this for the male adolescent athletes specifically. For females, that may be more incorporated when they're starting a new um, general physical activity or sport activity. Uh, so this would be include things like returning someone to running or when they start doing strength and conditioning based exercises, um, you know, in the clinic or, or in a weight room. Um, and also, um, you know, when they're starting to get actually back into their activity with their peers. So more of a personalized approach that it's not just when they're going to start their their sport, they're probably having fear before that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the other differences that you found. And I will completely ref tell you guys to look at at this table, it is amazing. You guys have a wonderful Venn diagram of differences between males and females and then what was what was shared and kind of went over that fear of re-injury and the locus of control a little bit more. Um, but tell us some more about the differences that you found between the males and female athletes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm just going to bring it up alongside with you. Um, so I think um, when we talk about some of the psychological distress rate, I had mentioned that there were definitely a lot of mood changes that were reported by both um, males and females. But um, male patients uh, more consistently reported being frustrated with this speed or the length of recovery, mm -hmm. which I think you can um, definitely find spread across a lot of uh, different athletes. But um, it just seemed to be a theme that popped up a little bit more um, based on uh, males experience. And I think um, another thing was um, like this, uh, whether individuals should be interacting with um, their teammates or not from like a social perspective. Um, and it, it seemed that females tended to find, um, uh, and not all of them, but females tended to find their uh, interactions of being incorporated with the team to some degree to be very helpful within their recovery process. And I think that really stems from, you know, this balancing of internal and external locus of control, um, because they had these interactions with their, with their teammates. Now that doesn't, that isn't to say that male participants or male, sorry, uh, male patients shouldn't be, um, also incorporated into team stuff. But I think for females, it seemed to be, um, increasingly helpful. Mm -hmm. And one of the other recommendations you made was this emphasis on learning goals rather than progress goals for males. Give us a little bit more insight and in what's the difference between these two learning and, and progress goals? Yeah, so like uh, you provided attention to that Venn, di Venn diagram. Um, I want to kind of highlight um, a review that was uh, done by Dr. Berland um, in uh, sports medicine that talked about this concept of learned helplessness. Um, and this is where this, uh, it was introduced to what learning goals were through reading this article. But basically this idea of learned helplessness, which uh, may occur after ACL reconstruction, um, has these complex interactions between neurological deficits and psychological barriers that um, may negatively impact a person's biomechanical uh, or neuromuscular performance, um, which can obviously be very problematic for individuals during their recovery. And she proposed that learning goals um, may be helpful in order to help um, overcome some of this learned helplessness that we may see in some of our patients. Um, and so the learning goals basically are helpful to de-emphasize these expectations related to something like a speed of recovery or achieving certain recovery milestones at time points that may ultimately be a little unrealistic or different in comparison to the healthcare provider to the view of the healthcare provider that you're working with. Um, and so the point of a learning goal um, is um, uh, to really introduce an individual to a task and reduce the, the fear of failure or um, this problematic thing where they may see a failing of, of meet, meeting a performance goal. And I wanna say that I'm not telling individuals to remove performance or progress goals out of their practice. They're extremely useful, um, especially in motivation and adherence. And we talk about goals, setting goals for our patients all the time. Um, but learning goals may, may precede um, the performance goals. So basically, in the case of something like return to running, which is a, a huge milestone for individuals after ACL reconstruction, you may start off with a learning goal, which um, is, uh, which just has individuals just try the task out. You don't um, provide them with any time, any speed, or any kind of mileage that they should be necessarily achieving that you might uh, do with like something like a performance goal. And this removes the failure from, from it and, and allows them to just uh, uh, experience the task and how they're, they're feeling with uh, performing it. And then once they start to ultimately feel comfortable with that task, that's when you can start to incorporate the performance goals um, be, uh, because they've overcome some of this initial psychological barrier that they might have. And you can add things such as time or mileage or, or speed um, into uh, uh, their goals for performing running.
So you're removing that possibility for failure, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So as we move forward, give us a little bit. Um, we've <laughs> You have so many actionable items and we've already talked about um, a lot of different changes and tweaks that people can make into their clinical practice. What are some other um, actionable items if somebody wanted to start something new today with a patient? What would you recommend? I think one of the easiest things to do is to promote positive self-talk. Uh, and uh, this is something that you can incorporate early and um, um, and as early as possible will allow uh, uh, patients to um, really start to integrate positive self-talk into um, their um, own recovery process. Uh, and so uh, um, basically with positive self-talk, um, it can improve an individual's self-efficacy. So basically that person's belief that they're able to uh, succeed. And greater self-efficacy has been shown to be um, related to better uh, self-reported need function, greater functional performance, and also rehabilitation um, compliance. Um, and so I think that positive self-talk is something that you can teach someone while um, there, you know, you're doing maybe some more ma manual therapy side of things or um, something that uh, when an individual is doing some type of recovery, if you're like, maybe you're including ice or heat or some type of modality to a certain capacity where an individual is a little bit more passive and not actively doing different tasks in, the, in their rehabilitation. Um, you can talk to them about this idea of positive self-talk, when to use it, how to recognize when you're not utilizing it, um, and really encourage them to continue to push through um, what they're going to and, and view things positively. So give me an example. How would you like role play this for me, right? How would you have that conversation with an athlete? Um, so I think uh, first uh, I would um, really try and understand uh, what an individual is, uh, how, how an individual is talking to themselves. Um, like, so asking them how they feel about their performance, maybe on a certain type of rehabilitation. Um, um, uh, uh, so like getting their range task. of motion back. Yeah, some, yeah. some rehabilitation task or something. Like, yeah. how are they feeling about how they completed it, right? And um, if people are talking about um, it being a negative experience experience for them completing the task, maybe trying to help them reframe um, what how they're feeling about that task. So obviously there's there's difficult tasks in rehabilitation. Um, that's in order to prog progress, you need to. Uh, do the in order to progress, you need to make tasks more difficult for individuals, and so uh, you know helping an an individual understand that it's okay to find difficulty with tasks and to just continue to encourage them, almost like to help them create a mantra of like I can. I can push through, I can do this specific type of activity. Um, so just having like a can, can do attitude, really, I guess, um, the, a mantra that they can, can consistently um, say in their own head when they experience a barrier in a specific rehabilitation task. Which really circles back to one of your findings of them a lot of times viewing this as an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to progress. So tapping, if having, find a way to tap into that for your athletes. Yeah. And I, I think, um, and I think that's a, that's a great uh, uh, takeaway point from this. Uh, I think another thing is um, that especially in adolescents, uh, adolescent athletes, they have a very strong athletic identity. Um, anyone that works in high school settings, especially I, I did personally, and um, 
sports is life. It, it is for some collegiate athletes too, but like sports is life for high school athletes. Um, and I think if, and this may be a little more difficult uh, as a clinician, but if you can, you can encourage them to do some self uh, a self improvement outside of their athletic identity. So maybe even encouraging them to look into um, other types of activities. One patient reported in in the study, she reported that she started to do more community service with veterans, and and she never had the opportunity to do that when she was constantly in sports and doing all that, and and how positively that impacted her life and um especially within her recovery seeing the adversity that these veterans had gone through this is just a specific example but um this can be an opportunity for individuals to explore things outside of their current athletic identity thank you so my last question for you is how did this project inform where you want to go in the future with your research? <laughs> well, um, well, that's a great question. Um, I think a huge thing for me um, and in that model of learned helplessness that I had talked about earlier, I, I'm very interested in this idea of how um, behavior can inform some of the uh, physical outcomes that we constantly focus on um, as healthcare providers. Um, and I am very interested in um, really exploring how um, in, uh, what interventions we or mechanistically first how some of these psychological aspects can um, uh, affect some of these physical outcomes. But I think also um, what are maybe some more, I guess, behavioral modification uh, based interventions that can um, improve uh, or o- help overcome these psychological barriers and ultimately help with other things to improve the physical outcomes that we're seeing as well. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Lisey, for joining us. I have to say it, Dr. Again, because congratulations on the newly minted degree. Um, And I just wanted to remind everyone that this manuscript, as well as all of the Journal of Athletic Training's offerings are available for free on our website. And there's a new feature of early access. So as soon as manuscripts are accepted for publication, they are now going up on the Journal of Athletic Training's website. So even more um, valuable information for for the research in the clinical community. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me.